You good? Okay. Now, we're starting the sermon, so catch the clock and have it go from zero up if you would and so on. Thank you very much. I want to introduce you to somebody, okay? Go ahead. I, he apparently is not going to be introduced just yet. I, I want to, are we good? Can we, yeah, thank you guys. Okay. Yeah, you're good. I want to introduce you to God, okay? This is God, okay? Now, I want to introduce, I, I picked somebody who was purposely a brick of a man. Because we understand that God is loving and he's merciful and all these other things which are very important and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the God that we're actually going after today so much. We're going after the one who is, you know, God of the universe. The one who created all the stars, all the heavens. The one who created, you know, billions of stars, billions of quasars and pulsars and black holes. And you can just imagine just the immensity of the universe. And this is God. The great I am. Now I want you to think about something. When you think about God the Father, by the way, I'm talking about God the Father. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is God technically. But we're talking about God the Father. And when you think about God the Father, where do you think of him as being? Out there, right? Up, you know, somewhere out there, but he's unthroned up in heaven somewhere else. And it's like the Holy Spirit and Jesus come and be with us. Right? Jesus came incarnationally, then he went back. Now the Holy Spirit's with us. But God the Father, he's up there, right? Except that, of course, it's not scriptural. Because what Jesus says very clearly is, we, Jesus and the Father, will come to you and make our home with you. And it's not just in the personage of the Holy Spirit. It's this other dimensionality that we talked about yesterday, where God is through all. And so the point is, the Father is here. I, when I say this, I want us to get a hold of something. I'm not going after just this idea that the Holy Spirit empowers us to reach out and touch somebody and see them be healed. I'm not actually going after that at all. Here's what I'm going after. I'm going after what is it to stand in the presence, to have God Almighty standing in your presence. What should that mean to your life? Let me ask it a certain way so that you can really get where we're going. How many people are walking in the authority of Yahweh? Yahweh. This is that name that God was given. God gave himself when, when Moses was, right, he'd, he'd been in, in Egypt and then he had killed someone and so he had to run away from Pharaoh and he was in the wilderness for 40 years. And God said, now go back to the most powerful nation on earth and deliver my people. I'm going to deliver them through you. And he says, he doesn't want to do this at all, but he says, who should I say has sent me? And God from the burning bush said, Yahweh, which is a tetragrammaton. And we don't even put vowel points with it in the Hebrew because it's too holy a name to utter. And by the way, that's a big mistake. Because the truth of the matter is, the name that God was giving Moses at that time was to be the most intimate name. Yahweh means I am. I am the, I'm the God of your ancestors. I'm the God of your descendants. I'm the God of that nation over there, and I'm the God of right here where you are. I'm the God of Egypt, in other words, and I'm the God of this plot of land where you are in this burning bush. Yahweh, I am. I am. Right now, I am. So here's my question to us. How many of us are living in the authority, in the power, in the glory and the majesty of what it is to have I am right here. See it? Okay? We're going to answer that question today. We're going to give you a way of thinking about it and of being with it to where you can be moving in an entirely different way in your life. And it's not just the empowering of the Spirit. It's the presence of the Father whose image we're also to be conformed unto. Right? Right? So that's what we're going to do. So Chad, you the man, you're going to be praying. Lift up the sermon, lift up another church. Thanks. Father in heaven, Lord, we just come before you and just thank you for being the great I am. Lord, just be with Kurt as he teaches us something new that you need to get in our hearts about who you are and where you're going with us. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord... I lift up Shehalem Valley Baptist Church and Pastor Ken in Newburgh, Oregon, and I just 
ask for growth and a new light in that church, Lord. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. I'm going to keep God up here with me, if that's all right with you, because I want to illustrate. It's awkward for him, so pray for him. But <laughs> Okay? I, I want an image to be in our minds that this is, this is our life. This is what's true. Now, watch. We're in our series here, which is demystifying the book of Revelation, and we are today at chapter 11. Chapter 11 is universally accepted to be the most difficult chapter in the, all of Scripture to interpret. And here's why. Because we made it complicated. The fact of the matter is it's no more difficult than any other chapter in the Bible. It's actually quite simple and very straightforward, as I'm going to show you. But the thing is, is what we do with things is we have things that we think about God, about life, about things that end up making things very complicated. In fact, impossibly complicated which we're going to see, and that's why when I say universally, it's almost universally accepted to be the most difficult chapter. Now, having said that, I just want us to look at a flow here because I want you to get the obvious flow of Revelation. All right, so we're going to take a minute. Here we go. Chapter 1, opening, Jesus is God, right? He shows up in majesty, right? He was Jesus that was incarnated and very relatable, Okay. But then all of a sudden, he was Jesus, God, in chapter 1. And this is the revelation of what all that means. The whole book is that revelation about Jesus, the end times, how he fulfills it, how everything goes. So then we get, let's look at the state of the church in chapters 2 and 3. And we get the state of Christians. And by the way, that plays forward all the way into today. And then we get a scene in heaven. Who is worthy to break the seals? We get that glorious scene in heaven, but there's a scroll and it's got six, seven seals on it. And who's worthy to break those seals? Nobody until all of a sudden the lamb that was slain shows up, Jesus. And he's the one who's worthy to break those seals and begin to, that begins to unleash a troubling time to the world. And so what happens is in the next two, in the next chapter, we have six of seven. The seventh isn't broken in this chapter. We have six seals, and it goes birth pangs to great tribulation. By the time we get to the fifth seal, as we've looked at from Matthew and Revelation 6 here, what happens is this is the time when Christians are being persecuted all out. Many of them are dying. This has gotten really bad. And what God is doing is, is he is allowing everybody in the whole world to see how bad things would really be if he wasn't restraining anymore. See? So what happens is, is that people are being killed, Christians are being persecuted, it's really bad for Christians, and then we get to that interlude where 144,000 are sealed. Now, really important here, this is the first place where scholars go wrong. Okay? Now watch this. Not all scholars, but a lot of them. Particularly ones that well, you'll get to it. 144,000 Jewish people sealed. Why do I say it's Jewish people? Because a lot of scholars would say, no, it's not Jewish people, it's Christians. But let's look at what the text says and decide, is this Christians or Jews that are being talked about? Because here's how Jesus talks about it. The number of the sealed, 144,000 from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from Judah, 12,000 from Reuben, from Gad, Asher, Nephtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now, does that sound like it's Christians? Or does it sound like it's Jewish people? I mean, why did God take so much time to repeat all of those names? He's trying to make something clear. I mean, the obvious meaning is he's not talking about Christians anymore. He's talking about Jewish people. He's taking 12,000 from each tribe, and he's sealing them against the judgment that's about to come on the world from the persecution of the Christians and everything else that's gone on before as people have gone away from God and walked away from Him. See that? So what happens is, at the first part of chapter 7, we have 144,000 Jewish people sealed, which is, and I'm saying this right now, it'll make more sense in a second, but that's the beginning, essentially, of the Jewish time clock coming back into being. It doesn't happen at exactly this moment, but this is roughly where this is, okay? Now, now watch this. See, it goes on in the second half of chapter 7 to say this. After I saw those 144,000 sealed that are staying on the earth, then what I saw is a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, language, which no one could number, standing before the throne, before the Lamb. 
One of the elders asked me, who are these people robed in white? Where do they come from? I said, I don't know. You know. He said, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Chapter 6, the fifth seal and the sixth. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are we talking about here? Christians. Where are they? In heaven. They're not here anymore. They have been raptured. Which is why what we say is, the second 7B is Christians are raptured out. Real simply. We're going to see this in a second, but let me just prep you for it right now. See, from Abraham, there was people before Abraham. But in, with Abraham, God was revealing himself to the world by choosing a people and interacting with them so that everybody could watch. And that happened right up until 40 years after Jesus' death. And then 40 years after Jesus' death, there is no more Israel. There's no more temple. 70 AD, the Romans come in, destroy everything. So now what there is is what we call the church age. And for 2,000 years now, we've been in the church age. As Scripture prophesied, as was said in many places, what's happened is, is that God is with Christians. It's not to say he's abandoned everybody else, but he's with Christians. He's living in them. He's moving through them. That's where the movement of God, the revelation of God is coming from, from Christians. As it was coming from Jews, now it's coming from Christians. But in the end, the Jews come back into play. And praise God that they do, because any scholar or Christian that wants to say that God is done with the Jews because they sinned so bad that he was finally erasing them completely from his plan ought to check themselves in the mirror pretty badly. Because that means you too can do things so bad that his arm isn't long enough to save. Thank God that that's not true. We are rebellious to the nth degree, just like the Jews. And God's arm is longer and stronger than all our rebellion to bring us home. Now that's the truth. And that's the truth why you've got to hold on to this, not this replacement theology that we're now Israel and Israel's totally out of the picture and everything that says Israel is supposed to be us. Which is, by the way, what people do when they say, you know, all those 12,000 and 12,000 and 12,000 from all those tribes? That's not really from Israel. That's really Christians because there's no more interest in the Jews. There's no more reason for the Jews. See what I'm saying? Right? So that's the basic outline. But now watch how this plays out. And we're going to go into maybe a little more detail. This may make your brain hurt a little bit. But hang in there with me because it gets to a place that is really important. Okay? So, so watch how it goes. Okay? Christians are raptured. Then the six trumpets are blown. Now, now look at the flow here. See, Christians are now out of the world. And now God unleashes his judgment on the world with 144,000 sealed from that judgment. Protected from it. That's what happens, okay? And then we get to the seventh trumpet, which is in the middle of chapter 11. We're not actually going to get to the verses there today, but in the middle of chapter 11, chapters 10 and 11, we get the seventh trumpet blown, and when the tr seventh trumpet blows, that's when Jesus shows up again. That's when he returns. Now, this is chapter 11. There's 22 chapters. How the heck does that work out? I'll show you in the weeks to come. But the bottom line is that seventh trump is when Jesus comes again. And here's why we know that. And, here's, and everything else that we know from the book. But we also know it from other books and other prophecies. There's so many other prophecies I could be doing. But I'm just doing a few for you. Here's Thessalonians. The Lord himself, this is Paul talking about Jesus. Jesus himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will raise from their graves, then together with them, we are still alive, remain on earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, where will we be with the Lord forever? Now, does that sound anything at all like what we saw in chapter 6? Where people who were in a situation are now called out of it? See? So that's what's being referred to, and it's in the same frame of time at which Jesus is coming back. And how does he come back again now? With a commanding shout, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. Last week we saw in chapter 10 exactly that. I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He called out with a loud voice, like a lion roaring, and it's in the days of the trumpet call that are sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God will be fully revealed. The fullness of it happens. In fact, he goes on to say this. 
just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. This is really important. Over and over and over, God self-references what he'd said before. Very key scripture in all the Bible goes like this. You can believe in any God that you want to believe in. But let me show you the one you ought to believe in. The one who can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. And then it happens. That's the God you ought to believe in. Because there ain't another God on the face of the earth that even makes that claim. And only the God who's totally in control could make that claim. See it? So what's happening is God all the time is saying, just like I said I'd do. Just like I said I'd do. Just like I said I'd do. I did just what I said I would do. And that becomes a remarkable thing when we look more deeply at it. Because you remember I told you about this timeline, which was prophesied in many other prophecies I could do, where there is this period of time that the Jews are in play, and then there's a period of time that the church is in play, but then the Jewish population comes back in play again? This too is just as was prophesied. I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of a mystery, so that you don't get wise and think that you're the new Jews and that you've replaced them and that they're of no value to God anymore. This is literally what he's saying. And what he says is, a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The church age. Paul is saying there's this period of time, but in the end, something happens out here. Now we're going to now we're going to look at how this was all prophesied way before 600 years almost before Christ. There's a guy named Daniel He's a little kid in Israel. Israel has been rebellious. God is going to cleanse them of a rebellion. He brings in the nation of Babylon, the kingdom of Babylon. The Babylon king comes in and destroys the country. The temple, very important, and the nation. There is no Israel. Way back 600 years before, there's no Israel. They, they made it a, 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 just a, 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 you know, a spot on their kingdom map drew their own lines, there was no nation, there was no place on the map that this is the land of the Jews where they still rule, where they still live, where they still do this. There were still some in the land cultivating, but there was no nation, there was no temple. Daniel then goes to Babylon, is highly exalted by God, and when he gets old, he says this. I, Daniel, was meditating on the scriptures that gave according to the word of God to the prophet Jeremiah. Now look what he's done. He's talking about, there's this prophet Jeremiah who said something, and what he said was, is that after 70 years of there being no nation, after 70 years of us being exiled, that God would miraculously bring us back. So I'm in Babylon, and it's like 70 years. So I'm praying, saying, hey, what up with that, God? You know, what are you doing? Now watch where he goes. The number of the years Jerusalem had to lie in ruins, namely 70. See, Jerusalem had to lie in ruins for 70 years. Just like Dan, Jeremiah said. So I turned to the master God, asking for an answer, praying earnestly, fasting for meals, wearing rough penitential burlap, and kneeling in the ashes. Now, this is a really important principle for us for the message for today. Watch this. Here's what Daniel could have done. He had influence in the king's court. He could have said, Jeremiah prophesied 70 years. Let me go over here and fix that. Because I actually have power to do something about it. And he actually did do some things. But I want to show you what Daniel didn't do. He didn't go fix it himself the way that he thought. What he did was, is he went to God and he said, what am I supposed to do? What is this about? What are you telling me to do? See where he goes first? And then that's what leads us into a revelation. See, when you go to God and ask him what's up, Keep going. By the way, he's fasting. He's praying earnestly. He's wearing rough cloth. He's kneeling in ashes. I, I just want to say something. He's not casually going, hey, I just read something interesting today. God, what are you going to do about it? Oh, you haven't answered me? Oh, well, I'll just move on with life. See, what he does is he says, there's something that you're doing, and I don't know what it is. And so I'm, I'm in ashes. I'm kneeling. I'm pressing in. I am doing a work, not works, but I'm doing a work, I'm doing an effort, I'm doing a labor because I'm trying to get a revelation from God about what this is about and what I'm not going to do is go do anything until I get the revelation. See it? And then what happens is 
Revelation. I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people. Who's he praying for? Christians? The whole world? No. Israelites. He's praying for my people, pleading with the Lord God of Jerusalem, pleading with the Lord God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. So what's he praying for? The nation of Israel and the temple. That's who he's praying for. Okay? Now, as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I'd seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me at the time and explained to me, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. Revelation. The moment you began praying, a command was given. Let me ask you a question. If he hadn't prayed, would the command have been given? Would the revelation have come if he hadn't prayed? Would it? This would be an encouragement for you to be here at 5 o'clock tonight. Okay? Now it goes on. I'm here to tell you what it was for you're very precious to God. Don't you love that? I just, I, I didn't really need it for the sermon but I couldn't delete it for the, even for the sake of time because I just went, that's too cool. Listen carefully so you can understand the meaning of the vision. A period of 70 sets of seven has been decreed for who? For Christians? For the world? For the people that you were praying about, the Jews, and for the temple, for the city. Okay? For the, been decreed for your people and your holy city, Jerusalem, which is in ruins. Okay? Now, to finish their rebellion the Jewish rebellion to put an end to their sin to atone for their guilt to bring in everlasting righteousness not the one that worked for 70 years and then they came back and ended up in a problem again everlasting righteousness to confirm the prophetic vision once again there he is saying well, like I said I do and to anoint the most holy place the temple okay now, now listen and understand. 70 sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, comes. Now, if you do a lot of study on this, you're going to find a lot of stuff written about this on the internet. I'm going to do a very much dumbed down version of it, but the one that I would be willing to defend. And if you ever really wanted to talk to me about it, feel free. But this is, it does get arcane, but it is important. Because some people will say, when, when was that command given? And some people will say it was in um, 458 or 448 or whatever it is. I, don't, I can't even remember the other date. But 454 is the one I'm going with. And that's in Ezra where it says the king told him, go back and start rebuilding. There's another command that was given later. But I'm going with the one that says this. And in, in order to get this all to work out with the other one, you have to come up with, with what they call prophetic years, which is 360, day, or 360 days in a year, not 365. But again, I want to take God at his plain meaning. A year is a year. A year is how long it takes for the earth to go around the sun. Okay? He, didn't, he didn't, wasn't using, like, fancy math. Okay? So I just want to go from 454 when the first king said... Go ahead, here's money, here's this, go start rebuilding. You can start going back. Okay? Now, when that happened, okay, the anointed one comes. Okay? So there's a, there's a, now watch. One of the other reasons for 454, and this is way too technical, but let me just say it. In 705, you have a really important date, which is the consecration of the rebuilt temple. So, the, you know how it says 7 and then 62 and then... One more, because 70 weeks total. See, 7 plus 62 is 69. And then you got one more week. Am I bending your brain already with math? I'm trying to keep this really simple. But why wouldn't you just say 69 and then 1? He says 7 and then 62 and then 1. Well, the 7 goes to the consecration of the temple. So it gives us another marker along the path. And then there's 62 weeks, 62 times 7, which is a total of, when you get to 69, you get to 483 years. Now, if you do the math and you work it all out and you do all this thing right, here's what you end up with. Now, this is really important. You end up at 30 AD. Now, a lot of people say Jesus died in 33 AD. You know why they do that? You know why most of us in here would think, when did Jesus die? 33 AD. You know why we think that? Because of Daniel. 
there's a guy who worked out mathematically what would happen if it was by that later date that I was talking about, and then you do the prophetic year, the 360 days, not the 365, and so on. And he worked it all out, and he said, therefore, Jesus had to die at 33 AD. But the truth of the matter is, the best scholars, the ones who are not getting to the death of Jesus circumspectly from somewhere else, but just going after it, are saying the most likely death, and there's a whole lot of scripture out there, you can look at it, it's likely to be 30 AD. That's the most likely date for his actual death. Now, let me just process for a second what we just said. God, 600 years before Jesus was alive, said that Messiah would come. By the way, that prophecy, that ti- the time at which that decree was given was in the month that we now call Nisan. In the Bible, it's called Abib. But Nisan is the month in which the Passover takes place, that the Passover lamb is killed. So he's saying 480, I think it's three, I'm getting my math wrong, but 483 years later from that decree, after this period of 62 weeks of seven, the anointed one will be killed. We have a prophecy in Scripture to the very month. And if you really want to work it, you can get it to the day. We can't confirm that that's the day that he died. So, okay. But I'm just telling you, you can work this more deeply than I have here, and you can get to a place to where God has told you the day that Jesus Christ would die on the cross. Can we just take a moment? (laughs) That's pretty important. God doesn't usually do things like that. He lays it out there in another way, and there's, you know, and everything else, and then we have by faith, we encounter it, and and then we see after it's done, oh, this was that. This was not that. This was God being incredibly specific from the get-go as to what all of this was about and where it was going to come to and why it was going to come to there. And here's what he's trying to do. Trust me. I'm in control. You know what? If I want to prophesy something 500 years from now, you know how hard it is for me to make that work out right? We think this way. See, here's the way our natural minds think. 500 years from now, that gives me a lot of time to get everything worked out to where it works out right. You know what? Actually, the longer the period of time to something working out well, the less likely it is to work out. Because the more time you got for it to go somewhere else. We are given free will. We are making decisions all the time. God has said, from this point to here. But there's no reason it has to go down that path. It could go all over the stinking place. Right? Just make a free will here and make a free will here and make a free will there. And pretty soon, who the heck, how the heck can you get there? If you are in a tank and you're trying to hit a target. Oh, no, I, I got a better one when we did the guns. Jonathan Houseman, are you here? Where are you? Are you here? Jonathan let me shoot his gun. We went and shot guns. And this was so cool. I really loved it. And, sorry, okay? But I did. And by the way, there's another guy who put his arm behind his back and was totally, you know, did that thing. That was the coolest thing ever. Okay? But, but Jonathan had this really, he actually is in the military and he shoots these things all the time. And he had this weapon that was like just bang, 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 and there's no recoil and everything else. Now, if you put that, that target, you know, that you run out, if you put that target right in front of you, you go bang, 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 you can get a really, if you put it out there like three feet, You're going to get a really tight grouping. That's what they call it, if you're good, right? You're going to get a really tight grouping and everything else. And if you're off a little bit, it's no big problem, right? But if you take that target and you run it back to the back of that range, which is about, what, 50 yards? Is that what it is? Anyway, about 50 yards away. If you're off just a little bit, you don't even hit the target. I mean, you really got to, you know, you know, and get it, you know. You really got to get it right just to even hit the target. Let alone get a tight grouping, for heaven's sakes. If you, I can't remember what the, what the statistics are, but if you're in a tank and you're shooting, if you're shooting at something really near, you can be off. It's near. It's a bomb. It's going to blow up. But if you're way far away, you get off one click at 1,500 yards, it blows up, and it doesn't do anything to your target. One click. The farther away you are, the more finely tuned you have to be. God is demonstrating by the way that he's given this prophecy that I not only can do the daily stuff that you need, the miracles, the right at the moment, the everything else, I not only can get that stuff done, but I got a long range target and I can hit that one perfectly too. You see it? 
Now, only a God who's completely in control could ever do that. Only a God who made the universe perfectly balance it so this little rock hurtling through space can support life. Finely tuned to 1 times 10, Hugh will tell you when he gets here. I think it's 1 times 10 about the 49th now. That's a number higher than the number of atoms. In other words, the fine tuning that's in the universe to get Earth itself to support life. The statistical analysis, it's 1 times 10 to the 47, 49th. And the number of atoms in the universe is less than that number. See what I'm saying? We are incredibly finely tuned. God is in control of the minutest things and the biggest ones. Now that's what's being said in this prophecy. And so he, this is what he's saying here. And by the way, I love this. He appeared to have accomplished nothing. Isn't that the best description of Jesus on the cross? Right? There were just a few people. It appeared like it was nothing. Here we are 2,000 years later, and it's half the world's population. But at the time, it didn't look like much. Then he goes on, a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. Guess what happens? Jesus dies 30 AD, one generation, a generation in the Bible is 40 years, one generation later, Jesus, God gave everybody who was alive at the time of Jesus an opportunity, an entire generation, to come to figure out who he was and to repent as a nation, to get back right with God through Christ. That's what he gave them. And after one generation was over, then God ended Jerusalem. He ended the nation of Israel. He ended the temple. It's all gone. This becomes really important for a second. Now, now watch something here. This is going to be important in a second, but just watch. Daniel is writing a prophecy from where? Babylon. From Babylon. Is there a nation of Israel when he's writing it? No. Is there a city of Jerusalem when he's writing it? No. Is there a temple when he's writing it? No. And yet he is prophesying that there's going to be a nation again, that there's going to be a city again, that there's going to be a temple again, and then it's going to get destroyed again. <laughs> this is, if you're prophesying for dollars... This is not the kind of prophecy you give. Nobody's going to believe you. This is just stupid. There isn't even a nation. What are you prophesying about? You see it? Hold on to that thought because it gets really good here in a second. Even better than that. Now watch. Now after that time, after the city's destroyed, the temple's destroyed, the nation's destroyed, after that, war and its miseries are decreed from that time to the very end. And indeed, since 70 AD till now, the world's been full of wars and misery. Just every, you know, all the time, war and misery and so on, right? Then it says this in this prophecy. The ruler is going to make a treaty with the people for a period of set of seven. After this half time, he'll put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. What do you have to have in order to make sacrifice? A temple. <laughs> so he's saying there's going to be this temple rebuilt. Is there a temple right now in Jerusalem? As, and as a climax to all of his terrible deeds, he's going to set up sacrilegious object, cause of desecration, the fate decreed, finally poured out on him. Okay? Now, okay, that's Daniel. Now we're to the chapter 11. The only two verses we're doing today because we're already getting there. Okay? Now watch. Then I was given a measuring stick and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the number of worshipers. Now remember, Daniel is prophesying into a time that there is no nation, there is no temple, there is no city. But guess what John's doing? When does John write Revelation? In 90 AD. Which is how long after there's no more temple, there's no more city, there's no more nation? 20 years. What the heck are you talking about, John? You're talking as if there's a temple again. Because he's being told to go measure it. <laughs> and to count the worshipers. Ah. Ah. Th this is... Now watch. John is prophesying the same way that Daniel did about something that doesn't exist whatsoever. Let me just do something, okay. You are... You're a person that's living 
before 1948, before World War II. So let's just take you back to 1900, or, or we can take you back to 1500, or we can take you back to 1000, or 500, whatever. Just any, any period of time since the end of Jerusalem until 1948. If you lived in any time during that period of time, and you were a good Christian, and you loved God, and you wanted to, you know, right? You, you know, and, and you know, people that really love God, they see how hard the world is, and they see how bad it is, and they see the sin in it, and they get to thinking that the end is going to come. We've looked at this before. They're thinking that the end is coming. The end is near. Now, if you live before 1948 and you saw these verses, what could you do with them? There's no nation of Israel. There's no city of Jerusalem in which could be a temple. It can't happen. So what do you do with those verses? Well, you allegorize them. You make it out to be about other things. It's the Christians, see? Now, see, the way we read Revelation, we said the Christians are, Christians are already raptured out. But most, a lot of scholars will look at this and they'll say, the temple of God, well, that's us, because we're called the temple of God, so that's us. And they're counting the number of Christians that are alive on the world, in the world. But we already saw in chapter 6 that they're raptured out. The whole thing is getting... I want to just take it one step deeper. I just want to show you something. Until 1948, when Israel is born, we just don't even have a frame of reference. But watch what this says right here. Do not measure the outer courtyard, for it's been turned over to the nations. They'll trample the holy city for 42 months. Do you realize the one part of the temple that's still standing when it was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans, the only part that's still standing is what's called the Wailing Wall. And this was because the Temple Mount wasn't large enough to put up King Herod's huge temple. Not the one that God wanted to build, but the one that Herod built. And so he built a retaining wall in order to build up what's called the Temple Mount in order that you could put the temple up there. And the only part of that temple that you can even get to, it's not the temple itself, it's just the grounds of it, is this wailing wall. And you see Jewish people and they stick their prayers in the wall with a little piece of paper and they do all this kind of stuff. And that's what it looks like. But here's what I want to show you. You remember what the prophecy said. It said that trampling the outer courts. Most people believe that dome on the rock is sitting right on top of where the temple would be. That's an Islamic Muslim holy site, the third most holy site. By the way, very interesting point that you need to just, just remember. The Muslims say this is where Abraham was ascended back unto God. That's what they say. Can I just tell you something? That's not in the Quran nor anywhere else. It was later on, hundreds of years later, that they said, oh, it must have been there. There isn't anything written, there isn't anything in its official literature whatsoever that says this is where Moses ascended again. It says he ascended. But it doesn't say here. So just, let me just take a second with you here. Let's just say that the Israeli-Islamic conflict doesn't get any better. Let's just say it gets worse, like it looks like it could, right? Now that there is a nation of Israel again, there's a conflict, right? Right? And let's just say that Iran launches a nuclear weapon or something happens and everything goes to hell in a handbasket and the whole world goes bad and pretty soon an antichrist, a leader, comes in and says, hey, I can fix this with you guys. Here's how I'm going to fix it. It turns out that, you see, B, there's the dome. It turns out that the temple might have been here. That's probably the most logical place that it actually was originally because again, remember, the whole temple mount was built up and Herod built another one. Or maybe over here. So here's what I'm going to do. The world has gone to hell in a handbasket. People are dying all over the world, war and famine, everything else, just like was already, we already looked at in Revelation and it's prophesied in other places. And all of a sudden the Antichrist comes and says, I have a solution. I am going to allow the Jews to rebuild their temple right there. And you see what's in the outer courtyard. Once again, can we just take a moment and go, wow. I mean, the specificity with which God is talking here is astounding. It ought to knock you off your... It ought to knock you off of everything that you could think. Right? But here's what we do instead. 
ah, you know, I lived before 1948, and so I'm going to allegorize it. I'm going to say it's really Christian. And so, and now all of a sudden, chapter 11 becomes very hard to, to describe because it's, they're not actually describing the simple thing it's saying, which is the time of the Jews is back in. The temple is rebuilt. It's built. Things are happening. They're doing the sacrifices. Then, the, then that Antichrist is going to put an end to those sacrifices after three and a half years. He's going to make a treaty with them, and he's going to break it, just like it says. That's pretty simple, right? But we're too smart for that. Come on, we're scholars. We're academics. We have to trust in all kinds of things. Sure, there's a God. But come on, get real. I wanna, I'm going to read you right now a short little passage from a commentary by an evangelical scholar. What that means is somebody who actually believes there is a God. There's lots of scholars out there in biblical stuff that don't believe there is a God and don't believe in prophecy and so on. And they just spend their whole lives doing that nonsense. And for heaven's sakes, God, you know, I feel so sorry for their souls, you know? But what they do, now what? Now this is an evangelical scholar, and I do want to say, he is not saying this is what he believes. He's relating the majority scholarship about Revelation. Now watch what he says. Okay? Um, sorry. Through, though Revelation was finally edited towards the end of the first century AD. What does that mean? It means John didn't actually write it. It means that there were these writings out there they were collected maybe by John, most likely in most scholars' mind by somebody else, and they put them together and called it the Revelation of John. But it wasn't really from John, for heaven's sakes. Come on, get real. Right? And this isn't reasonable to think. Well, let me show you how reasonable scholars can be. Watch this. Many commentators see two originally separate sources behind verses 1 and 2. Yarbo, Collins, etc. These sources are frequently thought to be two Jewish oracles that have been combined. This is what, what this means is two Jewish traditions about the end. And what happened was is this editor put these two Jewish things together. Uh, with, and then perhaps there's one interpolation in verse 8. Because in verse 8, there's a little Christianese thrown in there. See, there's how scholars think. And then they go on, and then other guys see all these people believe that. Others regard it as a single oracle. But now here's the point. Now watch what the scholars are doing. Let's make it clear. It wasn't John that wrote a prophecy. It was somebody that had a political agenda. And what they did is they gathered source material and they put it into something and put John's name on it and made it look like it was from that in order to do something that they wanted to do. Now these scholars are not willing to believe in the Bible that clearly in the book, that clearly prophesies to the day his death, to the day or the season of what's going to happen, something that now in 1948 we are much closer to just because there's now a nation of Israel and Jews are in Jerusalem and there are people that are studying so that when the temple gets rebuilt, all of this is now within the realm of possibility. But here's what the brilliant scholars would rather do than to believe something that 2,000 years later is miraculously again possible. They're wanting to believe in a document, in a story that nobody can verify, that nobody has any evidence of, that nobody has any reason whatsoever. Any idiot could walk in and say, so you got a document that is playing out in an unbelievably accurate way and you're going to trust some source material of which nobody has any idea what it is? How smart are you again? But we're not that way. See, we're not the kind of people who would walk away from God. We're not the kind of people who would get that far from God that we would believe in stupid stuff. Not intellectually rigorous and honest. That's, we don't do that. Here, I'm going to read you. This is from Christianity Today. It's going to take me one second. I could tell it to you, but it's just the powers in the reading, I think. Consider, they're talking about how do you interact with Scripture? How does your church interact with Scripture? Does it have a big Yahweh who's in whose presence you are and who you're to be kneeling before in order to get revelation about everything else? Or is everything else also in play so that it's kind of the love of this and the love of that? Watch. Consider the well-known story in 1 Samuel 17 in which David faces and defeats Goliath. Let me give you two possible approaches to preaching or teaching this text. And this is happening all over town right now. 
Neither sees it as simply an account of a border skirmish in ancient history. Both approaches understand the Bible as authoritative and important for us to study today. In the first approach, the character of Goliath becomes a metaphor for the challenges faced in daily life. Hearers are encouraged to identify the Goliaths in their own life. Low self-esteem, financial challenges, maybe a family problem. David becomes the model of an underdog who dares to step up to his own inner giants and challenges the Bible and, and challenges. To their own inner giants and challenges. The Bible is the answer book. It shows us how to face challenges in our personal life, visualizing a positive outcome like David, acting with confidence in the face of the challenge, taking risks. In this way, the Bible helps us solve our problems. Who's the hero, though, of the rendering of this story? David. More specifically, his courageous human will. David's faith in God is noted, but it's David's faith that is highlighted. The living God is not the major character in the story. In contrast, a theological interpretation of Scripture tries to understand the text as a part of a God-centered drama. In this approach, God's saving action is the center of the narrative. While the mighty Goliath can taunt the people of Israel, David confesses, the Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of the Philistine. Really important little point here. God has put David through things. But watch. Rather than seeing David as the self-actualized hero, the emphasis here is on the saving action of Almighty God, whom David actively trusts. As the text repeatedly notes, it was not a sword of David that brings deliverance from the Philistine. For the Lord does not save by the sword and spear, it says. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. Although David appears to be ill-prepared to encounter Goliath, David acts with a covenantal trust that, quote, the Lord will save me from the hand of the Philistine. Thus Thus we are invited to actively trust in this almighty God. The God of Israel who finally reveals the nature of the victory over his enemies in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, 1 Samuel narrates, narrative shows us God's surprising way of working, um, God's surprising way of working contrast with the worldly appearances of power. That God's different than what we think. That God's different than the world that we know. Paul reflects on this mystery as it culminates in Christ crucified. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. As disciples of Jesus, we are called through David and Goliath narrative to renew our trust in God, his deliverance, acting in confidence as we love God and our neighbor and witness God's power in Christ crucified. Our confidence in the Lord, not our faith in our commitment. It is the Lord who uses even those who appear weak and lowly to accomplish these purposes. Now, I just want to say, in this church, you're going to get that second sermon. I tried for years to do series where I would teach you how to be better husbands and better uh, workers and, and better this and better that. And there's churches all over the town that are doing this kind of stuff right now. And I do not mean to slam them as hard as it may seem. Because I think it's really important to be a good husband. I think it's really important to be a good steward. I think it's really important to be certain things in the world. I think these are really important things. And I appreciate that people are helping people to become these things. But here's what my problem is. All over town right now, people are being taught how to be better people so that this life is more manageable. And what they're not being taught is the, the, the depravity of our souls, the depravity of our situation, the hopelessness of our, of our circumstances, the need for Almighty God. This is what we need. This is what we need. This is what we need to be going after. This is what we need to be talking about. This is what we need to be doing. And I'm just going to give you one short illustration to really bring this home. I am, years ago, my daughter's actually here today, so just close your ears. (laughs) But years ago, when I lost all of our money, and then we had our kids, Julie and I talked, and we made a conscious decision, and we said, When our children get to college, I feel like the decisions I have made have limited the scope of what's possible for them in college. 
Not that they couldn't get good grades and get into Harvard or whatever, but it just felt like that the chances were that the decisions I made, the mistakes I made, were going to limit the possibility of the world in which they could have encountered had I not made those mistakes. And so we would do something that we would make sure that we paid for it. We made this decision before we were then later given a sizable gift to help our kids go wherever they wanted to go. But what we said was, is we will not make our kids work. Now, I, can I say something? I think kids that work in college are better off. Love you, honey. Okay? But it was just the thing that God had laid on our hearts, our personally, Okay? And it was the decision we made that we wanted them to experience college without all the other pressures, even though we kind of knew at the time they'd probably be better for them if they did work. Because, you know, people that work through college, work their way through college, they learn a lot. Maybe probably more, right? But the bottom line was it wasn't what we were comfortable with. It wasn't what we thought Lord was leading us to do. And so what we said was, is you go to school, we'll pay for it. And they both, unfortunately, did not pick local schools. They picked very expensive out-of-state schools. And the gift that we were given did not cover the whole of it. And now they've graduated. And guess who's left holding the bag? Now, I want to say something. We're okay. But, you know, as these loans are starting to kick in, they're not nothing. And it's a major impact on us. We don't have other debt. We don't have any credit card debt or anything else. It's just school loans. But bottom line, that's, by the way, by a thing of grace of God, But bottom line is, we have this substantial amount of debt. Now, here's what I can do as a human being, as a person who is in this dynamic right now. I can do this. I should go get another job just to make it more comfortable for us. You know, to where we could actually, you know, still take a vacation in the next 20 years. You know? I should should do some, I should go out and I should make something happen. See, I should be like Abraham and I should go out because God has told me at 100 years old that I'm going to have, or 87 years old, he told it to him. But at 87 years old, God told me I'm going to have a kid. That's not possible. You know, there's no Jerusalem. There's no temple. There's no Israel. This doesn't make any sense. Ah, oh, I got it. There's a handmaiden there. Okay, great. My wife told me I could. So I'm going to go to the handmaiden, and we're going to have a baby with the handmaiden. And you do realize that the conflict between Arabs and Israel comes from that decision. The conflict that will end the world. The conflict on which everything hinges. The conflict that is so obviously the one that is the major conflict in all the world comes from that one decision where Abraham decided he knew how to make this thing come to pass. So I could go out here and I could try and figure out what to do, but I'll tell you what I'm doing is I'm coming in here. I want you to hang in there with me on this because I'm about to say something different. But I come in here and I come to this moment and I come to this God. Now here's a really important truth. I want you to really listen. If I come to this God to hide, if I come to this God to walk away from, if I come to this God in order to get away from the reality of my problems, then I'm not actually going after God, am I? I'm just hiding. I'm just saying this isn't real. And guess what? God's really good at getting us real. You try and hide behind God sometime. To hide from the reality that he's trying to get you to face and deal with. Try and do that sometime. Guess what happens? It goes really hard on you. So this is not an excuse. Coming to God is not a way of getting away from what you have to engage in life. You know what it is? It's our only hope. Because my situation is impossible. Because whatever it is I'm looking at, even if it looks like I could have a way of figuring it out, you know how much better it is for us to understand that doing it our own way is not the right way? What we need to do is we need to come back to God in every moment, and we need to say, I need to hear from you what you have to say to me, because you're, I am. (laughs) You're the one who knows stuff about cities that don't exist, and temples that don't exist, and nations that don't exist, and solutions that I could never find. I need to be living in the presence of the brick, the creator. This is God. I need to be living right here every moment. Last week, I told you how to do it. I'm going to repeat it this week because it's so stinking important. God has given us a way to be made into the image of him. We looked at it yesterday at the men's meeting, which was incredibly powerful. Short and sweet, but powerful. 
When you pray in the Spirit, you lay down what your natural understanding is of everything. And you come into alignment with I am. You're on your knees now. And you're praying to the great I am, asking him for revelation about what you're to do to deal with it. And he may tell you, go to the doctor. And he may tell you not to. And he may tell you, go get a job. And he may tell you not to. It doesn't matter what he tells you. It, I mean, it doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what he tells you. <laughs> okay? Do you see it? And the only way that I can get to there, because I've got so much fear in me, because I'm concerned about what's going to happen relationally if we don't have any money, and I'm concerned about this, and I'm concerned about that. And the only way that I can do this is when I come before God, and I am praying in the Spirit, this is conforming me to Him, because it's the Holy Spirit that's praying through me according to His will. And that's the God who's then bringing me revelation so that I get lined up with His will. Now I am aligned. And I go out, and he's always with me. See? Do you see it? I really believe something, guys. I really believe that we have this tool, this thing that is silliness to the natural mind, this thing we don't know what to do with. I got a testimony from somebody about last week's sermon, and they said, I never thought about praying in the Spirit that way. For me, it was always when I get to a really bad place and I don't know what to do, I go to God and I ask Him. But he said, it never occurred to me that God, if I was always going to God, that He'd be continually revealing Himself to me, His ways, His will, and what He wants me to do, and that He would be conforming me to His image in doing that. It never occurred to me that what praying in the Spirit was about was revelation too. Not just on the knees submitted. It's on the knees submitted so that the God in the beginning of Revelation reaches down and lifts you up. Thank you, God. You're welcome. <laughs> Lord, in Jesus' holy and precious name, this congregation comes before the throne of the Almighty God. And we lift up that which is beyond our ability to understand. We humble ourselves and come before the God who knows all, who's got the long and the short and everything in between perfectly arranged and all he's trying to do is to get us lined up. In Jesus' holy and precious name, God, I'm asking you that you would do this in every person here, that we would learn how to be praying continually in the Spirit, how to come before you in a way that you were revealing more and more and more of you we want to come to you so that you will help us. You want us to come to you so that we will know you. God, teach us how to know you. In Jesus' holy and most incredible name. Thank you, God. Reach down in front of you and there's a communion. And take that lower cup and which is that bread, which is the broken life that we have put ourselves into by the choices, by the Isaacs that we have borne through our own decisions. And we take and we take our finger and we put it down in that cup and we break it saying, God, we know that we have broken our lives by the decisions that we have made. We have not got on our knees and sought you. And so in Jesus' holy and precious name, we lift up this cup in which is the broken body of Christ for the healing, for the wholeness. By his stripes we are healed. So God, make me whole with this now in Jesus' name. And now we lift this cup in which is the blood, in which is the life. And we say in Jesus' holy and precious name, God, your life be mine. In Jesus' holy and precious name, your life be the one that I lead. I can't do it, but I come to I am that you would do it through me. In Jesus' name, lift this cup and partake. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.
ushers, thanks for coming forward. I have taken this way beyond our time, and I am so sorry. God, help me with this in the future. But in Jesus' holy and precious name, God, we come before your throne right now, and we are coming before your throne in order to make an offering unto the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We do not live according to our understanding that, that talks about all these other factors. We live according to our understanding that you, God, have our lives in your hand and that you have commanded the tithe, the 10%, that you've commanded it. And so in Jesus' holy and precious name, we step into the life that you have by responding, knowing that you come and fill us and reveal to us and take us on that journey if we will just go with you. So in Jesus' name, we pour out into your kingdom, saying, come. We'll lift our eyes.